Ladies and gentlemen, very much welcome here to this breakout session. Special welcome to the distinguished speakers and head of delegations in this room here. And also welcome to all of you watching online. My name is Folke Gredén. I'm a Swedish television journalist and documentary producer. The title, the title of this very important session is Countering Contemporary Antisemitism and Other Forms of Racism Online and Offline. And what we would like to do here today during this hour is explore the nature of anti-Semitism and where it exists today. We will also cover good examples of combating anti-Semitism, anti-Gypsism and other forms of racism. Special focus, this is important, special focus will be given to social media and hate speech online. Now, the format. In this room, we do have distinguished head of delegation and speakers invited. We also have, joining us on the screen, speakers from outside. These speakers will present during three minutes, maximum three minutes, their message to us today. We will also have pledges made by particip participants on the screen. And if you're watching this now, you might want to put on your camera, on your computer, on your laptop. If you do, we would be able to see you, hopefully. So let's see if it works. Eventually, we'll get a picture of all the people joining us from outside. Now, in this room, you have headphones, and you have to have those headphones on in order to listen in to what we are saying. The headphones are also very good if you want to have speeches in languages that you don't speak translated. We have interpreters sitting, stand by, translating into several different languages. And again, you flip through the channels on your device and you will be able to listen in in your preferred language. So, let's start. Let's start by welcoming our special scene setter of this hour. I'm delighted to start by giving the floor to the CEO, Anti-Defamation League, Mr. Jonathan Greenblatt. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Folk. Good morning. I'm deeply grateful to Prime Minister Luffman for convening this historic event here in Malmo, a city that was once thought of as a hotbed of anti-Semitism. It is a statement of Sweden's commitment to the Jewish community that you're confronting this issue in this place. Bravo. I know we have limited time today, but as the CEO of the oldest anti-hate organization in America, I hope we can cover a broad range of topics in this session such as the recent surge of anti-Semitic incidents, the hateful dogma of anti-Zionism, the mainstreaming of conspiracy theories, and more. But I want to open and set the stage by talking about ADL's two, two of our top concerns. First, the most lethal anti-Semitic hate crimes, and second, the most prevalent online anti-Semitism. And I'll explain how ADL is working to combat these with innovation and partnerships. First, we must call out the clear and present danger of rising anti-Jewish violence. In recent years, the U.S. has been scarred by horrific acts targeting Jews from Pittsburgh to Brooklyn to Times Square. 
and we've seen devastating attacks across Europe for decades, recently in places like Halle, Paris, and again, even here in Malmo. These attacks, not always, but frequently are committed by ideological extremists, whether avowed white supremacists, determined Islamists, or radicalized lone wolves, all of whom victimize Jews simply for the crime of being Jewish. As this has happened in the context of a set of converging macro trends, including the rise of populism, the mainstreaming of extremism, and the normalization of anti-Semitism. Indeed, we see shocking dynamics on both ends of the spectrum that seem to converge around one common denominator, a shared venom for the Jewish people. On one side, we see, we see extreme right-wing pundits who paraphrase white supremacists without shame. And on the other, woke left-wing activists that parrot anti-Zionist talking points once pioneered by the Soviet Union. It's a stunning race to the bottom with the Jewish community taking fire from all sides. It's worth noting that monitoring these kinds of threats has been a core activity of ADL for decades. We, pre we have prevented multiple armed attacks over the years through extensive information sharing with law enforcement. But I'm proud that now we have formal partnerships with some of the most important institutions in our community with Hillel International to protect college students and campuses around the world, with the reform and conservative movements to safeguard our shoals and schools and summer camps. And we have just signed an agreement to train the thousands of volunteers in America who participate in the Community Security Service, an NGO whose members patrol synagogues across America every Shabbat to keep them safe. In the years ahead, we'll deepen these partnerships and build out even more to defend our community from the threat of violent anti-Semitism. The second challenge, as mentioned by Folk, is cyber hate. Indeed, social media is nothing less than a super spreader of anti-Semitism and intolerance. That's why an ADL, back in 2017, launched our Center for Technology and Society in Silicon Valley. And just as we tracked anti-Semitic incidents for generations offline, we've innovated our approaches and now we monitor anti-Jewish hate online. Our annual, the most recent edition of our annual online hate and harassment survey found that a whopping 41% of all Americans experience, regularly experience harassment online. Think about that, that's more than two in five users. Without a doubt, Big tech is monetizing anti-Semitism, racism, and disinformation in all forms. And so we need these companies, once and for all, to stop hate for profit. It's imperative for them to acknowledge, in the words of entertainer Sasha Baron Cohen, that freedom of speech is not freedom of reach. We need their leadership to take responsibility for building a propaganda apparatus so robust that it would make that Pravda pales in comparison and Der Sturmer looks tame by its standards. In light of this reality, perhaps it won't come as a surprise that ADL now employs data scientists, product managers, and software engineers who drive our work in this field. We collaborate closely with companies from Airbnb to Zoom, from Apple to Google, from PayPal to YouTube. Twitter to Clubhouse, pushing them to strengthen their policies and improve their products, not just by issuing press releases, but by giving them our detailed research and value-added recommendations about new features and functionality based on our technical know-how and industry expertise. And one last point. When we started on this journey back in 2017, I made an assertion that some questioned at the time, but now, especially after the revelations in the last few weeks, I think there can be no doubt. Facebook is the front line in fighting hate. Let's pause and think about it for a moment. With an estimated 2.9 billion users, it's far and away the world's largest social media platform. With $24 billion in net income last year, it's one of the most profitable companies on the planet. And with micro-targeting capabilities so robust, it simultaneously can serve different ads to users, not just living in the same household, sleeping in the same bed. It's the most robust advertising platform in the history of capitalism. And at the same time, there's no doubt 
It's been exploited by extremists and its algorithms have amplified anti-Semitism for far too long. It's more, there's no company that's more responsible for the toxic stew of anti-Jewish hate and extremism that seemingly infected every sphere of our public life. As revealed by Facebook whistleblower Francis Haugen, the company knew this fact for years, but chose not to do anything about it, or literally not enough. And so I believe it's long overdue for Facebook to do what any other business in any other industry would do if their product didn't work. Take it offline and fix it. But since it seems unwilling to undertake this most basic act of self-repair, I would argue that the time has come for regulatory intervention. Whether that comes from Brussels or Washington, D.C., or even Jerusalem, governments must hold Facebook accountable for its malign practices and monopolistic indifference in order to protect our children and our communities. Finally, while there's no one single vaccine that can stop the pandemic of prejudice, I believe there's a cure, and this brings me to my last point, the potential of education to stop the spread of hate. It might not be easy, but education is the only durable, long-term solution to ignorance. It can come in many forms, sometimes through shared service, sometimes through classroom experiences or coexistence activities, or even online learning. ADL knows this work well because we've been engaged in anti-bias education longer than any other nonprofit, Jewish or non-Jewish, in the U.S. First developed in the early 80s, today our educational programs reach more than 1.5 million students across America. Bina is our latest offering, a pure play digital product developed in collaboration with a leading ed tech company. It was designed with a single purpose in mind, to educate non-Jewish students about the Jewish community and anti-Semitism. And as a CEO who's rigorously focused on assessing our impact, I can tell you that our early indicators are very positive. We've been able to measure that students that take Bina have improved attitudes toward Jewish people after completing the course. And it Literally, we developed Bina because our, it addresses the number one concern we've heard from Jewish communities around the world, that general public simply doesn't know enough about Jews and Jewish identity, and that vacuum is often filled with anti-Semitic stereotypes. Bina changes that, and as a dynamic cloud-based product, it can be iterated more quickly and scaled more efficiently than in-person learning. And finally, we designed it for the TikTok generation. It can be experienced in bite-sized chunks through an iPhone or a Chromebook or even an Xbox. And that's my personal pledge here today, folks. ADL's commitment to this forum is to bring Bina to our partners here in Europe. Working hand-in-hand -hand with Jewish communities, we can customize Bina, translate it, and optimize it so that it can succeed in the cultural context of your specific country. And together we can use education to interrupt intolerance before it ever takes root in the next generation. So violence, cyber hate, and education. If we can work together to tackle those three challenges, Jewish communities around the world will live more confidently and more freely in a safer world. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Greenblatt, that was a very strong message, sir. Thank you very much for your pledge. Now, now we will start by taking the next step. And uh, this involves the speakers and head of delegations here in this room and also participating on the screen. Now, each of you will have a maximum of three minutes. And there's going to be a clock on the side here. Maybe we can have it uh, displayed. A countdown uh, is going to be shown on the screen and pay attention to the time. Why? Because we would like everyone to be able to speak here today, of course. So, having said that, I also would like to say that if you feel you're running out of time and if you feel that you have to be cut short, don't panic. There's going to be time, hopefully, there's going to be time after the speakers have performed. There's going to be time for comments and questions 
and you will have hopefully a ch second chance. I would like to start this by turning to the towards the screen and hopefully we will connect to Ireland. Is that the case or should we be? We are connecting to Ireland. Very much uh, welcome, Kishok Martin from Ireland, of course. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your title correctly, but sir, the floor is, is yours. Thank you indeed, and thanks for the introduction, uh, Falke, and your pronunciation is very good. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, John Jonathan for a very, very thought-provoking presentation. And of course, I thank my colleague, Stefan, uh, Prime Minister, uh, for convening this gathering and for inviting me to participate. And I'm very honoured uh, and grateful to join you today uh, to reaffirm Ireland's commitment to Holocaust remembrance and to combating anti-Semitism. 76 years after the end of the Holocaust, we remain inspired by these survivors, including those who spoke today. And we rededicate ourselves, not just to remember, but also to renew our legal and moral commitment to react. Hate speech has endured through millennia, periodically inflamed by the rhetoric of extreme nationalism, religious intolerance, racism, and the desire to scapegoat. In the context of the Holocaust, which we, rem which we remember today, it was enabled by the silence of leaders who ignored the reality until it was too late for six million Jewish people and millions of other victims who were persecuted and murdered due to their ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, political affiliations, or beliefs. Today, old prejudices and hatreds are being reanimated, now through new technologies and ever-evolving platforms, as we've heard from Jonathan. We are experiencing a surge in misinformation and disinformation, an increase in anti-Semitism and other religious hate speech, and we are ever vigilant of the insidious and creeping denial of the Holocaust and other genocides. Today, the growing trend in online hate speech compounded by conflict, racism, misogyny, even COVID-19 pandemic misinformation, threatens our fundamental aspirations under the UN Charter to safeguard human rights and achieve fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. Indeed, the principles of proper functioning of democracy itself are under sustained attack. As outlined in our pledges, the government of Ireland that I lead is fully committed to countering these threats. Through our proposed hate crime legislation, we will introduce new legislation to combat incitement to hatred and hate crime in Ireland, online and offline. This will introduce an offence of inciting hatred against another person or group due to characteristics including race, religion, ethnic or national origin. It will also create a new offence of denying or grossly trivialising crimes of genocide, including Holocaust denial. We will publish a new national action plan on racism, including measures to combat anti-Semitism, anti-Gypsyism and other forms of racism. And we were pleased to recently join with other countries at the United Nations Human Rights Council in signing a joint statement pledging to combat anti-Semitism. It will surprise none of you when I say that education remains the most important tool we have to tackle prejudice and hatred. But education is not just for our children, it is also for their teachers and for all of us. In Ireland, we will deliver revised curricula and teacher training on the Holocaust that will contribute to promoting overall equality and diversity. Before I conclude, let me recall Ireland's National Holocaust Memorial Day in January. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were denied the opportunity to meet in person, but the online commemorations allowed us to reach a new and larger audience. This example of the positive role the internet can play is a reminder that with appropriate regulation, the online space can be a helpful platform for remembrance and for action. It can help us as we commemorate the Holocaust and as we educate the public to fight against anti-Semitism and racism. As I reaffirmed to the people of Ireland last January, 
Ireland is absolutely committed to Holocaust remembrance and to fighting the scourge of anti-Semitism and racism. It is only through remembrance and education that we can strive to ensure that nothing like the Holocaust can ever be allowed to happen again. Thank you indeed. Thank you very much. There is a hand of applause here from Sweden. I hope you can hear us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And good day. Well, thank you very much from, from Ireland. And uh, I would like to state as well that uh, uh, the audience uh, that are following us online, there is a possibility for some of you to be able to comment on what's said here. And uh, please do so. And uh, hopefully the organizers will relay some of your comments to me so I can put them up in the uh, final uh, part of this session. Let's move on from Ireland down uh, back here in uh, real life, I would like to introduce, I'm delighted that we do have Vice President of the EU Commission, Mr. Skinas, here with us. Sir, I yield the floor to you. Thank you. Um, I'm standing here, rather sitting here, uh, and uh, I'm very proud to come with the first ever EU strategy for combating anti-Semitism and fostering Jewish life in Europe that we adopted only last week in time for the Malmö conference. The starting point is that for Europe, the Holocaust is an inedible stain in our history and it's beyond any doubt the darkest chapter of our history book. And we have a, a double duty. One is to face up to the historical responsibility, the burden of history on our shoulders, to cope with the negative impact of the Holocaust to generations of Europeans, but also at the same time make the European Union a place where we can develop efficient responses to the many modern threats that are clouding the, the life of our Jewish citizens in Europe. So this strategy is precisely about how we cope with this double uh, responsibility. And we highlight three families of issues that are of relevance and I'm sure they will be discussing uh, here in this panel today. The first is that we have to hit the problem at its core, and this is the online world. This is where lots of the nasty st stuff is happening. The pandemic was an accelerator, as Jonathan said, and we have now the obligation to work with ID, IT companies, platforms, but also the Jewish organizations to develop effective, robust, fact-checking and rebuttal capacities in real time. The second area of concern is security. It's unfair for our Jewish communities in Europe to assume themselves the cost of security. This can no longer be the case. We will step in and assume, help, contribute to security arrangements for the Jewish communities in Europe, starting next year with a sum of 25 million euros explicitly, exclusively dedicated to the security of our uh, Jewish citizens across the European Union. And finally, point three, we need to do better on remembrance, especially as the last survivors are leaving us with their painful memories. And we propose to set up an extensive network of young ambassadors that can be activated to tell the story of their parents and their grandparents. But also, we're setting up a European network of sites connected to the Holocaust, not only the camps, but also deportation points, ghettos, many locations across the continent that have been linked to the drama of our Jewish citizens. And we hope, together with the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, who honors us with her presence today, to be able to do that 
efficiently, effectively, and swiftly. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Another strong message. Thank you, sir. Then let's move on. You already mentioned the next speaker. We are very honored, of course, to have Secretary General of Council of Europe, Madame Boric, here with us today. And I know you're going to start in French and continue in English, right? Yeah. But you still only have three minutes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Madame. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much indeed. So the title is Remember, React. I'll start with Remember. The Council of Europe was set up just after the Second World War to build peace based on justice and international cooperation. The horrors of the war should never be repeated. Right from the outset, our organization made a commitment to combat anti-Semitism. And a few weeks after I started my job, there was the terrible attack already mentioned against the Halle Synagogue in Germany, the day of Yom Kippur. And that reminded us of the importance of this commitment. Unfortunately, this wasn't an isolated incident. That is why the fight against anti-Semitism is a priority in the new strategy of the Council of Europe for the four years to come. Now, reacting. We have tools already with which we can act. The European Convention on Human Rights was the starting point and the leitmotif, and the European Court, as already been mentioned, the European Court of Human Rights has clearly confirmed that it does not protect Holocaust denial and freedom of expression cannot be invoked in such a case. Last month, our Commission Against Racism and Intolerance issued a new general policy recommendation on preventing and combating anti-Semitism. It's not a strategy like Skinner's mentioned, but it's a very, very thick and important guide to the governments how to proceed with uh, old and new uh, types of anti-Semitism. So I will refer to its major points. One is on protection of Jews, Jewish communities and their institutions. It urges governments to ensure the cooperation required to provide security and law enforcement. On prosecution, it is clear that anti-Semitic crimes committed online must be punished, punished just as the crimes offline that illegal anti-Semitic hate speech are removed promptly by internet services providers, that was also touched before, and that governments should regulate internet companies, helping them achieve this in compliance with international human rights standards. This is in line uh, with our another convention on cybercrime and its protocol in particular, concerning the criminalization of racist and xenophobic acts committed through computer systems and will be completed, I hope, uh, next year by a comprehensive recommendation that will address hate speech, including in the context of the online environment, which was mentioned. And something else which was mentioned in the inaugural speech, and I must repeat, political leaders and other public figures must take a firm stand uh, against anti-Semitism whenever and wherever it occurs. In this respect, I welcome legislation in a number of our member states. Crucially, there must also be effective measures for prevention and, very importantly, and underlined by almost everyone who spoke today, education. Uh, our new observatory on history teaching will play its part. And for actors at every level, the working definition of anti-Semitism provided by IRA is a good basis to, on which to build. And moving forward, we will step up application of our standards and my recent appointment of a special representative on anti-Semitic and other forms of religious hate crimes is designed to ensure that the collective expertise of our organization is put to full use. Jewish life and heritage are integral to Europe's 
past, present, and the future. And in that way, I can only say that anti-Semitism must be confronted and stopped, and that the Council of Europe is dedicated to that work. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Another excellent speech here in this room. Now we will move on and we will turn towards the screen. And if I'm correctly informed, we're going to be see, able to see on the screen two pledges, videotaped pledges. The first one is from Monaco. Its Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation, Isabel Rosa Bernetto. And the second film, I think they're going to be one after the other. The second film is from the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, Secretary, Secretary General Dr. Meyer. Please uh, show the presentations. Monaco pledges to perpetuate the memory of the Holocaust through education to make the younger generation ready to stand up against hatred and prejudice. Monaco pledges to remember the victims of Nazi racial ideology. A conference room in our Oceanographic Institute will soon be named after the Council of Poland in Monaco, Mr. Ochsner, who lost his life in the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp. Monaco pledges to make an annual financial contribution to the Auschwitz-Birkenau Foundation from 2022 onwards. Discrimination against Roma has existed for centuries. Anti-Roma discrimination was a central element of the genocide of the Roma carried out by Nazi Germany and its collaborators. The neglect of the genocide of the Roma has contributed to the prejudice and discrimination that many Roma communities still experience today. Anti-Roma discrimination undermines the core values of our democratic societies. And it is dangerous. It leads to violence and to murder. States have committed themselves to fighting discriminatory practices, but too little has been done. We need to ensure that young people learn about the genocide of the Roma to honor the victims and to help fight discrimination that persists today. The IRA pledges to develop recommendations for teaching and learning about the Roma genocide. The recommendations will provide guidance on how to teach about the genocide of the Roma in different contexts. Thank you for those video pledges. And let's move on to the next speaker. We've been uh, hearing about social media being mentioned here online, offline comments. And we're delighted to be able to include here today Head of Europe, YouTube Europe, Mr. Pedro Pina. Welcome, sir. Thank the you. floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, of course, the first words have to be to thank the uh, Swedish government and the Prime Minister for inviting us here today to discuss such an important issue such uh, as fighting uh, anti-Semitism and um, perpetuating the memory of the Holocaust. Um, but I should start by saying I'm, I'm not a member of the Jewish community. And so, therefore, I cannot even begin to understand what it is to be subject to anti-Semitism. However, I'm a gay man. And I have a personal uh, experience with hate and what it is to be hated for being who I am. So it's of personal significance for me to be present here today. Um, and I, therefore, come bearer of two very important messages. The first message is that we are prepared to make significant investments of the tune of more than 5 million euros in uh, sponsoring and providing support to organizations that are mapping out anti-Semitism online and offline and fighting anti-Semitism overall, as well as providing uh, ad credits to governments and organizations to continue to spread the memory of the Holocaust. But the second message is that there is no space for hate speech on YouTube. We just simply don't tolerate it. Anti-Semitism is a very pernicious type of violent content that exists online. And through our robust policies, which we review on an ongoing basis, with the help of organizations such as the one from Jonathan, we are fighting this fight every day, 24-7. It's relentless, it's a 24-7 uh, type of work, but we believe we're making significant progress. 
right now we prohibit any content that um, promotes violence or hate against individuals or groups for in, under protected characteristics such as religion. We um, prohibit content denying well-documented violent events such as the Holocaust. And we prohibit content glorifying supremacy or Nazism. All of that content is simply removed from our platform. Now, we all grapple with this tension that was mentioned before between um, freedom of expression or freedom of speech and the need to keep our platform safe. And this is a tension that we have to manage on an ongoing basis with the help of a lot of experts that we engage with from regulators and governments to organizations for, from which we really welcome the expertise to find the right balance and to draw the, light, the right line on how to manage that tension. But one thing is for sure, and I'm going to steal your line, um, freedom of speech is not freedom of reach and therefore borderline content that brushes against our very precise guidelines. We reduce the oxygen of it. We remove the presence of it in our platform, uh, whilst at the same time we rise authoritative content in our platform all the time. In fact, if you search on YouTube content around the Holocaust, you will find documentaries around the Holocaust, as well as the testimony for some of the most uh, incredible testimonies from some of the most um, uh, incredible survivors, some of them we were uh, witnessing today. So we remove bad content, we reduce borderline content, and we raise authoritative questions all the time with the help of so many people uh, we women work. We, so we may not be perfect, but we are making, we believe, very, very significant projects. And our commitment is to continue to fight anti-Semitism and to be an ally against violence against the Jewish community and other um, uh, uh, undervalued and, and uh, vulnerable communities. And when it comes to the YouTube, and if it depends on YouTube, the Holocaust will never be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Pina, thank you very much. I'm sure your pledge and the million dollars you're going to spend now will make the headlines, $5 million uh, or euros. Um, it's going to be... Uh, making headlines tomorrow, newspapers and news circles. Thank, again, thank you very much. So let's move on. And um, why not um, move to Sweden, since we're here? We're delighted, of course, to be able to have with us the Minister for Gender Equality and Housing, Marta Stenevi. Madam Minister, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. I'm honored for the opportunity to be part of this very important session. And I'd also like you to welcome you all to my hometown of Malmö. From history and from the present, we know that words are never just words. They can hurt and they can give rise to violence. From terrible events at places like Halle, Christchurch and the Swedish uh, town of Trollhättan, it has become terrifyingly clear that the step between hateful posts online and concrete violent actions and terrorist attacks is never far away. Exposure to anti-Semitism and other forms of racism, such, that, such as anti as the racism against the Sami, uh, as Afrophobia and Islamophobia, uh, um, affects both individuals and society at large. It curtails equal opportunities for individuals through discrimination and it challenges the mutual trust that is so vital to our democratic societies. Although anti-Semitism is ancient and has historical roots, it seems to be reshaped and take on different expressions depending on the environments that we find ourselves in. Often this process goes hand in hand with various conspiracy theories that carry certain reoccurring traits but make use of current topics in public debate, such as the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed. And the same forces that spread racism often also show hatred against women, LGBTIQ persons and persons belonging to minorities. And this contributes to the dehumanization of people. Five years ago, my government decided on a national plan against racism, similar forms of hostility and hate crime. The plan takes an integrated approach 
and compromise their strategies and measures to prevent and combat racism, LGBTIQ phobia and hate crime. Our experience from working with the plan is that it's important to examine what needs are common to different groups and what different forms of racism have in common. But also to focus on specific forms of racism, including anti-Semitism, to be more efficient. I'd like to spend a few words uh, on one of the pledges that Sweden is making to this conference. We are further strengthening our work against different forms of racism online and offline. Next year, an action program with measures against anti-Semitism will be presented and implemented in the coming years. Action programs targeting Afrophobia, anti-Gypsyism, Islamophobia and racism against the Sami linked to the current plan will also be presented. The programs will include measures in the field of education, continued and enhanced efforts by the police to counter racism and hate crime, as well as an assignment to the Swedish Defense Research Agency to continuously monitor anti-Semitism and other forms of racism, hate speech and violent extremists in digital environments. And with these efforts, we aim to take significant and important steps to prevent and combat anti-Semitism and other forms of racism in our society. Together with the other initiatives presented at the meeting today, we are better equipped and determined to break the historic chain of anti-Semitism and push back on all forms of racism. Our efforts must continue relentlessly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again, and from Sweden we turn uh, uh, to Hungary, and uh, very much welcome to the Minister of Families, Katlin Novak. Madam. Thank you so much, and thank you also for organizing this event. For us uh, Hungarians, remembering Holocaust and combating anti-Semitism is a must, uh, also because 10% of the victims of the Holocaust uh, were of Hungarian origin. If you go outside and you see this exhibition, you can see that the survivals many times also come from Hungary, so they are Hungarians. I just uh, named some good practices we have in Hungary, and then I would like to raise your attention to a current threat. The Hungarian government uh, has zero, zero tolerance uh, policy on anti-Semitism. Since 2015, our government has provided over 23.5 million euros for the renovation of Jewish community spaces and synagogues. Just this year, we inaugurated the Rumbach Shebestin Synagogue in Budapest. I had the honor to represent the Hungarian government and President Lauder was also our guest of honor. Uh, the Holocaust education is mandatory part of our uh, national curriculum. We are in cooperation with the three, three main Jewish religious denominations, and also we worked on the content of our national curriculum clo in close co collaboration with 17 Jewish, uh, com uh, with the Jewish Community Roundtable represented 17 uh, uh, Jewish and Holocaust remembrance organizations. And we also do remember and teach about the Parimus, uh, also because 7% of our people are of Roma origin. So for us, it is also very important to teach uh, in our national curriculum about their history and culture uh, for Roma and Roma, Roma Hungarian students. We also protect our borders in order to protect also the members of our Jewish community. And uh, for this reason, we now have safety and peace for our uh, Jewish uh, people in Hungary, Jewish and non-Jewish Hungarians, and also visitors can live uh, freely and, uh, and uh, in peace in Hungary together. In Serbia, we are, we are just about to have a Holocaust memorial site together with the Serbian government in Bor. And uh, as a mother, just, let me, just, just please uh, let me take one personal note. We speak about the importance of teaching uh, about uh, Holocaust and uh, raising awareness uh, to, to anti-Semitism, but I, I also ask myself, as a mother of three children, do I myself do everything at home in my family to teach my own children about this? Uh, and one, uh, one uh, more or less element is that I would like to raise your awareness to a threat, an actual threat which exists in Hungary right now, is that there is an anti-Semite, an openly anti-Semite party in Hungary, which makes, or, or which, which its members make, make uh, uh, openly anti-Semite 
Islamite statements. They, some of their uh, representatives also use the Nazi great greetings and so on. And this openly anti-Semite, your big party is now allied with the left, with the socialists, with the Greens, with the liberals, everybody. And no, no echo internationally about it. So if we speak about the importance of combating anti-Semitism, why don't we raise awareness? Why don't we raise our voices? Why don't we say that this should not ever happen, that an, an openly anti-Semite party gains governmental power in a European state? That is their aim, together with the left. So I would like to ask you all to raise your voices against this happening in Hungary. And that's one thing we can do against anti-Semitism right now. Thank you so much for your, for your attention. Thank you very much. Again, very interesting. Thank you for sharing pledges. And we turn from Hungary east. Uh, we're going to turn to Russia. And please, uh, we would like to welcome Deputy Speaker of the Federal Council of the Federal Assembly, Mr. Konstantin Kosashev, sir, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was wondering which language I would uh, speak to you. Uh, I possess both English and Swedish, your mother tongue, but I will definitely prefer to speak Russian for the simple reason that was uh, the language used by Red Army soldiers while liberating Auschwitz on the 27th of January 1945. So the 27th of January 1945, the 27th of January was by the decision of the United Nations uh, declared as the International uh, Holocaust uh, Victims uh, Day in uh, Russia too, and uh, Russia joined this uh, tradition uh, we have this uh, date as a national date uh, commemorated in Russia after liberation of, uh, of the Auschwitz. One of the, uh, of the uh, death camp prisoners wrote a letter, uh, stated, I was saved and brought back to life by Russians. His name was Otto Front. Uh, two years later, he will publish a diary of his uh, daughter named Anna. Uh, this diary is known to the entire mankind. Holocaust is a part of tragic history of Russia itself. Out of six million uh, Jews annihilated by Nazis, 40% were citizens of the former Soviet Union. In the family of the speaker of the upper chamber of the uh, Russian parliament, Madame Valentina Matvienko, who uh, um, received a prize uh, back in 2020 uh, for uh, Holocaust remembrance. Uh, they remember in her family uh, how her mother uh, uh, resided in the occupied territory, risking her life, was hiding a, a Jewish woman with her children, uh, saving her from imminent uh, death. Annually, uh, Russia uh, hails uh, week of uh, Holocaust remembers. This uh, topic is included in the graduation exam for Russian school children. An encyclopedia entitled Holocaust on the territory of uh, the Soviet Union was published. That's why the systematic countering of neo-Nazism, neo-nationalism, and other forms of extremism should be a priority. Russia brings a draft resolution uh, on this topic at every UN General Assembly. Uh, supported by the vast majority of uh, UN delegations, uh, unfortunately uh, voted against only by US and uh, Ukraine. Unfortunately, many European countries still abstain from voting for this uh, uh, resolution. The Nazi ideology uh, was uh, born on the European soil. Uh, that's why uh, Europe has a special responsibility for countering the revival of uh, uh, xenophobic ideas. Uh, we see uh, the revival of xenophobic uh, uh, ideas in Europe, uh, uh, in the republics uh, of former uh, USSR, uh, where during the occupation, less than 5% of uh, original uh, Jewish population uh, survived. Uh, they hail uh, former Nazi collaborators uh, as uh, uh, national heroes. Uh, uh, 
namely in these countries, the minorities' rights are infringed on a systematic uh, basis. Uh, the non-citizen uh, institution is still uh, existent in the Baltic uh, countries. Uh, uh, there are uh, examples of that in uh, Ukraine. We uh, still uh, have to do uh, a lot. We uh, still have to counter uh, Holocaust. This should not be uh, forgotten, and remember, should be uh, should be sustained. Thank you. Spasiba. <laughs> So, uh, our last speaker today, we would like to, to welcome, I'm delighted to be able to present to you the Executive Director, ILGA World, Mr. André Duplessis. Sir. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Um, we're remembering today, and we're remembering how anti-Semitism flourished in a society that was really warped into compliant acceptance of hate. Uh, that was done through misinformation campaigns. Um, it was done through bringing about laws that targeted minorities and restricted them over a decade at least uh, in the run-up to the Holocaust. And some of those people were LGBT people, lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender, intersex persons who were sentenced to prison, placed in concentration camps, forced to wear pink triangles, they were subject to being cured uh, by experimental, uh, um, uh, ex experimental operations. And we remember. And I'm grateful to those who have remembered LGBTI people as being part of the Holocaust, as we remember Jews and Roma and many others. And we've heard so much how nationalism and fascism are on the rise again in this continent, in this country. And once again, we see the same things happening, and they are linked. My organization had graffiti on the outside. We were vandalized with anti-Semitic, linked with anti-homophobic, linked with transphobic, mixed with conspiracy theories, um, targeting a whole mix of misinformation. It's online and it's offline. It happens. And let me tell you that hate speech is not just words. Hate speech is actually killing people. We have lesbian and gay children. We have trans youth who are seeing online again and again and again that they don't matter, that they are not good enough, that they are dirty and not worthy of respect until they can be over some age, and they are being told no. And they are harming themselves and they are killing themselves. Governments, you have a duty to protect children. That includes trans, lesbian, gay, bisexual youth and children. And that means allowing positive depictions of LGBTI persons in schools, in families, in advertising, on the television, so they can learn that they are not despicable people who will not wanted by society. They will learn from an early age, and we've heard so much about how important it has been for Holocaust survivors to go and speak to children and say, never again will this happen. So yes, we want positive actions. We want there to be uh, talking to children in schools to be able to explain what happened in the Holocaust and why it should never happen again. And European leaders especially, please be bold. Take action to hold on to those ideals. We need you. This continent cannot let the Holocaust happen again. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, sir. Pleasure to listen to you as well. And that concludes our speakers here. And because the whole day is running a little bit late and, and uh, this session as well, we will uh, uh, try to wrap it up now. And we will, uh, uh, of course, have a chance to talk to each other during the whole day as much as we want. And I encourage you to talk to each other because that's why we're here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's been an amazing, important, a strong hour, I would say. Um, we have been thrilled to, to listen to you, distinguished speakers, head of delegations, and also participating overseas online 
uh, you have been representing different countries, different organizations, and different perspectives. And I've been fascinated to learn uh, about the challenges today that you all have been talking about. Uh, these challenges are, of course, not to be taken lightly. Uh, and today in this room, ladies and gentlemen, we have been assured, I would say, we have been assured that these challenges will be met. Because I was thinking, today in this room, we heard about pledges and commitments and promises and wiles. And this is very, very hopeful. It's extremely hopeful. Why? Because these pledges will be followed up, of course. And we will leave this room, I would say, with a sincere feeling that it's now time to react and that we will act together in a joint effort. We will stand together combating anti-Semitism and racism in all the forms and shapes. So finally, now, now is the time to move from words to action. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Served in special places, you're going to find your way outside. <laughs>